But first, let's devote some time where we will... I'll be asking you to throw some punches at each other, to try and be and throw some criticisms onto the other's views, because it's true that we may show things that are great in theory, you know, or in a PowerPoint presentation, but then when you want to realize these, when you want to make this come true, then there is a certain attachment. So if you can point at some drawbacks in the other's presentation, please feel free to do so. But then, first, uh, I have a question for you. For all things we have seen so far, or you've been discussing so far, do you have the feeling that later on companies, schools, organizations are able to manage this change after working with them on consultancy or coaching them, supporting them, when it comes to implementing these changes, can they really make it? Are they effective? It's like after hard work they can realize change? What do you think about that? I think that the proof was seen in just an hour ago. Each of the four projects we have seen is a project uh, that has interpreted these discourse and has brought it back into their own reality, be it La Agostera, Barcelona, and so on. And these are very fine examples on how things can be done and are being done. Uh, and I think that they are very important in the message we convey. The message is that the change is in us, and in, it's in schools. In I think that we have the best teachers already, the best educational leaders. But what is required is for schools, first of all, to really buy it, to really believe in it, and then to start working on this change, a change in attitudes, a change in dialogue, in the way we approach things. We need more discussion on education. There is often much discussion within schools on other things, on targets, goals, outcomes. And when if we do these things, things really work out. But then it's incorporated into a profoundly technological setting, which is open. And we are changing that ourselves. And this is important in that we need to be able to shape up people that will eventually conform this landscape at the end of the day. And so this landscape will be hopefully defined by many of the students that are now in school. So there is much uh, importance in our shoulders. And if we moved into a dystopia or into a utopia, we'll very much depend on what we do in our schools. And we are, have seen that and we will be seeing that in a few minutes. Yes, Denise. I think that schools have an edge in that most traditional companies or major organizations are tempted to think that what you need to do is like just amending things. If you are the head of digital transformation at a newspaper, you may think about, well, how about we come up with a new newspaper? Or if you are in SEAT, the automotive company, which by the way, just launched a new company because they think that they cannot change it, so they'll let's do a different thing. But then this is not something you are willing to do. It's not like you, well, let's come up with a new school. No, this is not a solution you resort to. And this is quite helpful because it's really more helpful in arranging your roadmap. Like, it's never gonna be sorted out by uh, creating a new organization. And this is one of the reasons and why I believe that yes, we will be doing that with these teachers, with these parents, with these kids and with this building, of course. 
because solution lies not in looking for different parents, different teachers, different buildings, different kids. No, no matter if, how hard you try. Nope. Now, this is really interesting, probably a food for another discussion, but this brings back to me when we were talking about how we were approaching this panel discussion and the your presentations. One thing you mentioned, Janice, is that often when we want to realize change, when we want to bring about change, it's not the changes we do, but the initial diagnosis of the changes required, which often percolates the process and you will want to change things that believe are not working, but maybe these are not the things that we're not really working, but then there are some others, some underlying factors that you have been uh, in the dark. And how can you work it out in an education setting? Well, this was one of my suggestions, precisely, in the need to incorporate a view from outside, from outside the education world. And so you may recognize that some of your diagnoses are not exclusive to the educational world. I think it's good and it's open and it opens up the range of likely solutions. It's something that after and that also happens to other organizations and companies. If you look at things from the same perspective, same group, you tend to recreate the same lookingness. For instance, some experts are looking at themselves is journalists. Like they all the media world they look inwardly. But I've never seen like groups of butchers telling how difficult it is to be a butcher. So and and I know how services should be and then and, and I want to be provocative here but sometimes you need to share even in diagnosing the external view but of course when it comes to the action plan you really need to be fully aware but when it comes to diagnosing is something that you need to bring in yes I fully share that and also much internal dialogue is required I'm very much obsessed on the idea of changing these individualistic approaches in learning like it's me my classroom my students my issues and moving on to a shared view there is much discussion lacking within schools on what education really means we would require a more common language for instance often there are some discussions some faculty discussions that maybe they are not referring to the same thing so indeed we need to open up our eyes and to extend our view but and only by removing pressure it's opening up and the other way to alleviate pressure is by not being individuals but groups and I think that on this starting diagnose it would be indeed a luxury a luxury that often we cannot have but it's a luxury to devote some time to jointly think about together with the whole the educational community what would be the target what would be the way ahead and Janine's presentation was great in that I was trying to translate these into our world, the world of education, and it was much enriching on that regard. Yet, I think that there is something that should be done differently in schools. I said that this change is at the core of the school, it should be done by the school and with an educational project that again, as Janice was saying, must have a vision. We need to have cl clearly in our minds where we want to go, we in how we want to move. And the only thing I would be changing in this roadmap and how to do things is that I would start from some in-house discussion, but then also doing things, doing uh, specific things with the specific projects that allow us to move forward and to confront the individual vision so that 
maybe not during the first day, first year, but after a given time, we have a vision on the how the vision often may not be before, but rather in between. First, you need to start the walking. You need to have some clear ideas, some proper analysis. But once you start to, to move, I'm sure you can bring in the individual visions to create a shared vision. And this is a bit of a change when it comes to strategic planning, uh, the more standard planning. But then we will agree in that at the end of the day, that proposal vision action and team is no arrangement, is no timing. That's a diagnosis. And maybe you begin by action. And yes, I should begin with a team, with the peoples. If you have the people, that's great. But and how you build people? Well, by doing things and often. And teams, people are truly important. And therefore, yeah, I think that the true lever for change is in this team building effort that it's based on mutual trust, on peer support, on shared knowledge and a series of things that we need to be doing within every school. Now that's interesting because we've been receiving some Twitter questions and some of them I think that they also admit that there is a need for a change for a vision but then it's like climbing uphill to many so how can you be more specific on that you were saying that at first in that you need some small achievements so that you can promote change and you can have the support of our community how can we break this down into a smaller more um, accessible parts. Well, it needs to be a satisfactory outcome. And that's an individual mindset. It must be meaningful for the person doing that work. So there are people requiring recognition. There are some others that don't. But so the meaningfulness, the satisfaction, it will depend on the people participating. But then it's very important that the players I mean, the individuals that have participated on that first effort, they have a meaningful, a satisfactory uh, assessment on it so that they feel better, that they enjoy, they, they learn. So it may change depending on the person. But then I think it's critical to have that. And this is why it's important when doing a small test, you shouldn't be too naive in that it should be chosen as a, in a way that it's uh, that it succeeds so do it with the people that you will most find that will most likely find a success so that the people will know it work but uh, again I would never advertise that I have a outstanding plan even if I had because probably it not be wrong so no major projects, no major announcements. But it's good to have a roadmap in your mind. And that's something that you may have shared with some others. But I would be more tactical in mindset here in that there are some organizations where you bring in everyone. And then in some others, that may be a hurdle. And you may need to have the inner circle of four people and then move forward. A question for you, Carlos. We are much in touch with several leadership teams in schools, in companies. And I would say that a common thing they ask to us is to see more examples which are helpful to them examples of best practices and so on but then there is a risk in it if I see best practices but cannot be implemented in my case might be side tracking us but how can you work that how can you work on this knowledge transfer pedagogical knowledge is really 
difficult to bring into practice, into realities. Majestic. It is. It's majesticky. And you know that. In that, it's really difficult to take it from you and place it someplace else. And yet, we need to transfer this knowledge. When I was saying that the school is the center, at the core of change, well, I'm, I, I've said also the network of schools, but it's not just the teachers or the leaders' projects that will bring about change. The change will be with the schools and schools' networks, and we need to create these networks of schools. And we are starting on that. There's Some would come out more naturally. For instance, as we see in state-subsidized schools, and we should be doing from public schools, from fully funded government schools, to create these type of networks. Something which is crucial because it's the only way to learn from others' experience. Maybe not in best practices, but in hopeful practices. We need to derive hope from other people's experiences and therefore we need to create networks. Networks which are existing in an informal pattern. There are more and more networks, and more so here in Catalonia, Rosas and Sad being an example of on, an organization of people exchanging knowledge, issues, challenges. And networks of schools exchanging people, staff visiting one another, discussing with thing, things with one another. And this is crucial if we want an equitable, impactful change because otherwise it will happen as it's been the case so far. Small changes with very specific teachers which are unsustainable and even in some instances there was no single project but, but things would change depending on the classroom which is something that we would not feed. Crucial and yet highly difficult and this is why is such a sticky knowledge that is not that easily transferred to other people and it can only be done so by moving closer to the other. Yep. Good friends. Janice. Uh, if I may, uh, forget about you being a consultant here in my next question. Is there a magic recipe that would work for everyone? And I know that this may not work as a consultant because otherwise you would be out of job. But let's say we should come up with a template that could be used for every school manager. Yes, uh, it's easy. <laughs> just look at your examples and just do it. Yeah, or just look into your students' eyes and work it on that. So, since all schools are different, we all have our things, We will we be requiring a different model for each of them? Well, this is why it's so difficult and why we've been turning our heads down on it. Um, because since what we are doing is so structural and the idea we've been told again and again and I think I think wrongfully is speed we are trying to manage a social change and not a tech change but it's the social environment that's changed not just the technology and even if we have new versions every six months of technology we cannot manage that in just uh, social change under six months. This is why I try to convey that th we are working on uh, decade uh, staging because here in Catalonia, uh, probably I got this figure wrong, but in primary and secondary schools, and correct me if I'm wrong, I think it's 60, 70,000 teachers. How can you? expect a group of 70,000 people to change in under six months or six years. I mean, you just can't. It's simply impossible. So, this is a process. And what's really hurting us is trying to make it, to speed it up. 
So we need to accept that this is an ongoing, permanent change. Instead of like expecting you were in place A and then you are in when you are in place B, you can sit that back and relax. No, at the end of the day, is are you willing to change and never stop changing? You need to change your way of doing things, your dynamics. You need to rethink, re redo things, and then you move on to that direction. And and it, I wish you better luck in the not in the comic example. It was like back in the 40s, someone said, I wish Europe for the countries. Well, this type of vision set all your roadmap, and we don't have a Europe yet, but then we're working along these lines. And so, if we were told, now we already have a Europe, well, maybe you'd be disappointed in that, this idea of I have already transformed my school might be the wrong message. It's rather that my school is reconsidering things, is rethinking, rethinking things, and it moves along a given path. Uh, when you look around and see some schools that have brought the process of change, they have never, they never did so in just two, five years, or and none of them claim that they have already finished, that they're already done. Yes, and this is not just a technological, digital change. It implies a fully reconsidering of the school. There is a book that has been published by Mariano Fernandez Anguita, a social scientist in the world of education, and with a very explanatory title. is more school, less classroom. And probably we are shifting on to a full reconsideration of what uh, schools are and mean. So probably we need more powerful schools that should challenge the way we approach classroom, discipline, curriculum. And the projects we have seen so far are doing away with these subjects, with these ways of approaching things. They are cross-cutting, they are horizontal, they leave no one behind. They are moving away from the silo mind mentality in schools. And it's something that is crucial in the times we live in. So again, this is a process, this is an itinerary that we will be facing our hurdles and we cannot just stop. If we, can see, if we see that as a closed process, then we will fail. Well, on that matter, I have many doubts on the future of university, but then not that much on the future of school. I think that schools are essential, but then I have my doubts on universities. By the way, my kid is at the university and he, he told me, um, well, I've been told that the king is about here in Barcelona. Let's see if I can grab him so that he can sign my degree uh, that I can save two years time. Yeah, new approach, new approach. Yeah, he's a smart man. Now, let me open the f uh, possibilities for questions to the floor. So any takers, please raise your hand. Um, feel free to interrupt us. One more thing, uh, one more question we are being asked. Could, can there be an educational innovation by fully rejecting the new technologies? Is there any sense in it? Would, there make any, would that make any sense? Well, I never speak about technologies. Uh, it's not of interest to me. Not at all. There is a sociologist, Paula Civili from Argentina, with an idea that I find very interesting. Every society picks its technology. We have picked this one. I'm not a victim of it. I've chosen this technology because I wanted a different relationship with information. We felt 
like information flows had changed and we required a different relationship with information. We required a relationship that with no intermediates, without the need to go through a central hub that could change, edit, or delete that. We wanted a faster way, and, so, and this is why we chose this technology. I never refer to technology as a, wow, where is that going to take us? No. It seems clear to me that we are shifting on to a different world, and if it's going to be better, it's going to be through this technology. But like any technology, at first, we will have to understand that, we will have to adopt it, and we will have to to change it if required and it may sound like uh, a fight here but truly I love this technology because this is what allows me to approach things differently so I just wouldn't um, think that this is something I would approach without this technology it's precisely because of this technology that I can work on things that we were asking for as a society Yes, uh, the idea is that, that has been stressed again and again is that the setting we live in and the environment we're in, the places we are, the, that what signals how we relate with one another. And any policy, even if it's just a school policy, by leaving things out will not move us forward. Technology, in the um, tells us what we are as people, as a, society, as a society, and then we should also be able to amend, to redefine these technologies, to fine-tune it if required, so that our responsibility is to redefine it, since technology is also redefining us. Having said that, schools often have innovation without technology, but then is innovation that responds to the present setting. And you could see that from a different view. I could start on a transformational project by only resorting to spaces, by changing and tearing down walls, because that, that would allow me to change the educational processes. I could incorporate technology in it or not. But since I'm surrounded by technology where learning takes place sometimes with or without technology. I, I cannot just say that the, there is no innovation without technology. There is without specific devices, but yet the setting is fully technological and digital. And technology is helping us understand things that we were wanting for years. And when you do by, when you learn by doing the active pedagogy, active methodologies that we are now seeing in project-based learning and these technologies which are which may seem old and they did not work back then because the infrastructure the ecosystem the technologies would not facilitate that and this is something that many have claimed for long but probably now in the ecosystem where we are this may work better service learning, project-based learning, uh, challenge-based learning, which is what we are doing by bringing together, by blending together these, and this being a good example on how the synergies are created with the old uh, model and with the new experiences, because for years we have been trying to educate everyone, leaving no one behind, without leaving 30% of the population that's failing. For years we've been working to find education for life, a comprehensive education. And this is what's done on this digital technological context, with or without technology. One question over there. Please introduce yourself, Raquel Mino. Carry on, Raquel. My gratitude goes to you because of this uh, fruitful exchange. It's fruitful for them as well, for every one of us here. My question, please uh, share some ideas related to how educational agencies, schools, we can input into mitigating, playing down, changing, 
inequality, social, cultural, financial, technical inequalities, gender inequalities in children's portfolio from home. Let me add my remark. I do share this feeling that uh, colleges must be rethought at many dimensions as it happens with uh, schools. At the university, we are slower at it. I've got the feeling that uh, universities should be criticized, should be changed, but uh, I think we can't do without that organization. I, we universities say uh, schools can be changed, modified, they make sense uh, currently. And you're listening that uh, colleges uh, make no sense. Well, I think it's, uh, I think uh, it's uh, too much of a challenge. You've talked about networking, sharing. This is my question as well. How universities, campuses, educational campuses can work together with uh, schools so that we are not a left over, left behind in the current society? That's quite of, a, of an answer, of a question to answer. Two questions. First, how? Well, you needed specific cases to manage, to fight inequalities students bring from home to the classroom. I don't know how to do it. This is a big challenge for the school when uh, dealing with uh, diversity, with inequality. This is a challenge that has been hard for schools to face. Traditional schools are selective, picky. The one we have now in our case includes 20% of failure with uh, educational exclusion. 20% of uh, exclusion implies that 20% of our kids don't reach the minimum drop off, don't graduate. This school is still selective. Training for something uh, we don't know that comes later is a big challenge that has scaled up. Diversity in classrooms uh, bigger. This is our big question to answer, and schools failed to answer that. It was a sort of a ladder, a uh, social lift bringing us upstairs. However, usually it's been a sort of pyramid, vertical one. As we climbed steps, uh, people dropped off. And in the community, we needed to be a sort of a flat pyramid with many people at the top. Then now what's going to happen next? This is the big challenge for the schools. This can be faced only by the school. For that, the input of uh, everyone else is needed. The schools uh, have a role to play in what we were saying, that a change in our teacher's hand, our learner's hand our evaluators hand, school that's not set on theoretical knowledge, but on skill-based knowledge, ensuring people to use knowledge they learn now, they get uh, trained in critical dimensions in their personality, in the society, in the academy, that's the school we aim at, we work for, that plays a role in this digital environment we dwell on. Projects uh, showcased today are highly digital and uh, do face that challenge, that of equality. School for everyone so that no one's left behind. That's the utopian school for years. That's not selective. This is our big challenge, our big difficulty, making us think that uh, it's not my playing my role as a teacher with uh, for students who are very diverse, but I must uh, work uh, in a team with two, three fellow teachers who work with that uh, team of students in a, uh, in a sort of uh, more customized way. Let's not think that everything solved with uh, uh, better trained uh, teachers, more teachers, but uh, teaching teams that cater better to diversity, that's the one way to face the challenge of a school for others. Second question, diversity. Sorry, I don't know. 
they told me that a big difference in the campus, not in education colleges, but in campuses. For instance, you go to law college. There are people there who are lawyers who teach. But if they are asked whether they feel themselves as lawyers, and also say teachers at the college, conversely in the schools, everyone considers himself or herself a teacher. Generalizations are generalizing so bad, but there is more vocation, more commitment, more engagement, more development, more innovation, education-wide in the schools versus campuses, broadly speaking, because there are more people who are more vocational about it in uh, uh, schools versus universities. We all know about excellent university teachers, but there, there is a higher rate of teachers at university who don't think themselves uh, as teachers, which is contrary to what we find in the schools. Also, there's a sort of hierarchy in secondary training. I don't know where, where it comes from. Sorry, but we are making a mess of it. It's somehow messy, as little as I know. The relation between the college and school is desirable but eligible for improvement. One issue with the school is the university. The university is uh, an issue for the school. Let's uh, re-engineer the role of baccalaureate and education from uh, 16 years uh, upwards. It's not been fixed yet with our reformation process. Difficulties you may stumble against in the classroom in compulsory 12 to 16 for everyone, leaving no one behind. These are difficulties inherited constantly that show up constantly in your classrooms because of little flexibility in the systems, because of the failed reform of baccalaureate that is a sort of no man's land, because of the transmission-based model, though we are now on the Bologna way. It is highly specific knowledge employed by Bologna, but uh, this sets our teacher's hand in a primary school teacher's hands, the way we approach university baccalaureate, access to university with the admission examination to university, that, this does register with our teacher's hand in the classroom, in primary school environments, even in elementary school, schooling. It's not a headline. The priority for the school's university right now, and it demands our rethinking that link between age 16, compulsory 16, forward. We need more roadmaps, roadmaps, other ways to get in and out, much more flexibility so that uh, a teacher or a, or a innovative teacher or an innovative school in elementary school is no longer the case at uh, high school. And uh, in uh, secondary, third, or fourth, the professor gets, uh, the teacher gets uh, stressed. Uh, really, I bow to the role played by high school teachers uh, right now because they are so flexible and adjusted to times. And this goes together with your question about the school as a guarantee of success for everyone, minimum knowledge for everyone, with KOL for everyone. Both things uh, match and go together. Fortunately, time's over. We are late. Thank you, speakers. Let's carry on.